Hi everyone, it's Professor Crimson, and in this video we're going to talk about the definite integral and the limit of a Riemann sum. So in the previous video we talked about the Riemann method to calculate the area under the curve using approximation rectangles, using the left endpoint, the right endpoint, and also the midpoint of each subinterval. In this video we're going to talk about the definition of the definite integral and also the limit of the Riemann sum to approximate the area under a curve. So let's pick up where we left off. The definition of the definite integral. If the function f of x is a continuous function on the closed interval x equals a to x equals b, then it can be shown that the limit of the left sums and the right sums approach the same real number, capital A, as the number of approximating rectangles increase without bound. So in other words, if you increase the number of rectangles that you're using to approximate the area under the curve, starting at x equals a and then ending at x equals b, then the approximation will become more and more accurate as the number of rectangles increase. So the definite integral, the definite integral of a continuous function f of x over a closed interval x equals a to x equals b is a limit of a Riemann sum for the function. The area from x equals a to x equals b is denoted this way. You have the integral symbol, you have the function f of x dx, so f of x is still called the integrand. The dx tells you that the variable integration is still x, but what's different compared to the indefinite integral symbol is that you have numbers that will be on the integral sign. You have x equals a and x equals b. So these are x values because the variable integration is x. So the lower limit of integration is a because the area starts at x equals a, and the upper limit of integration is x equals b, or just b, because that's where the area stops. The definite integral can be approximated by a Riemann sum by dividing the area up into approximation rectangles, where the height of each rectangle is determined by the value of the function y equals f of x. So we talked about this in the last video when we had the height of the rectangle was determined by the left endpoint or the right endpoint or sometimes even the midpoint. Then we can calculate the area of each rectangle using the Riemann method and then adding up the resulting areas of these rectangles. So what we were talking about before is that if we increase the number of rectangles, if we increase the number of approximating rectangles, then the better approximation we'll have for the actual area under the curve that's bounded by the x-axis between x equals a and x equals b. In other words, the limit of the Riemann sum for the function on the closed interval x equals a to x equals b exists. Then the definite integral, so the definite integral from x equals a to x equals b of f of x dx is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity where the number of rectangles increase indefinitely. Then you have the Riemann sum, which is giving you the areas of the rectangles. So if you have i equals 1 to n, so you have n rectangles that you want to add up their areas. You have f of c sub i times delta x. So we talked about f of c sub i is either the left endpoint or right endpoint or the midpoint for us in this class. The delta x is the width of each rectangle. So if you increase the number of rectangles, then the widths of each rectangle will get smaller and smaller, and that means that your approximation will become more and more accurate to the actual area, capital A. Example 4, limit of a Riemann sum. The graph shows the function y equals r of t that represents the number of telephone calls made per hour on a Tuesday of any given week, where t is the number of hours since noon, 12 p.m. So on the t-axis, you have the times after 12 p.m., so you have 9 p.m., 10 p.m., and 11 p.m., so this would be t equals 9, t equals 10, and t equals 11, respectively. The vertical axis is representing calls per hour, and the function y equals r of t is the number of phone calls made per hour. And the problem says, determine an approximation for the number of calls that were made between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. Express the approximation as a definite integral and approximate the value using a Riemann sum. The accumulated number of calls between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. can be represented using a Riemann sum. So we're going to represent the Riemann sum as the area under the curve of y equals r of t from t equals 9 to t equals 11. So this can be represented as a definite integral. The total number of calls would be the definite integral from t equals 9, that's where the area starts, to t equals 11, that's where the area stops, of r of t, where the function r of t represents the number of calls received. And we're going to approximate this definite integral using the Riemann sum. So one way to approximate the definite integral is to use four subintervals, or four rectangles. So we're going to go from i equals 1 to 4 for the Riemann sum of f of c sub i, so that's the height of the rectangles, or height of each subinterval, times delta x, which is the width of each subinterval. We're going to approximate the Riemann sum using four rectangles of equal width, and we're going to use left endpoints, for example. So if the area starts at t equals 9, and we're going up to t equals 11, let's create a number line that we're going to partition up into four rectangles. So we have t equals 9 to t equals 11. We want to break this up into four equal rectangles. So first rectangle will go between 9 and 9.5. Then the next rectangle between 9.5 and 10. Third rectangle between 10 and 10.5. And the last one between 10.5 and 11. Notice that each rectangle will have the same width 
because the width of each rectangle will be 11 minus 9, that's the width of the interval, divided by 4 rectangles, so that's 2 divided by 4, or 1 half, or 0 0.5. So each rectangle will have a width of 0 0.5. And now, since we're using left-hand endpoints, we can approximate the area under the curve using the Riemann sum. So the sum I equals 1 to 4 of these approximations for the areas, f of c sub i delta x, we want to use c sub i's as the left-hand endpoints. So the left-hand endpoints would be first rectangle would be use 9, the second rectangle would use 9.5, third rectangle would use 10, and the last rectangle would use the left endpoint 10.5. And the width of each rectangle is 0 0.5. So you would have f of 9 times 0 0.5, the second rectangle would be f of 9.5 times 0 0.5, third rectangle's area would be f of 10 times 0 0.5, and the last rectangle would have an area of f of 10.5 times 0 0.5. These values, 9, 9.5, 10, and 10.5, they go into the function. The function was given by the graph. So from the graph, it looks like at 9 p.m., the number of calls received were about 100. So 100 times 0.5 would be the area of the first rectangle. At 9.5 or 9.30, the number of calls received was about 150 from the graph. So 150 times 0.5. The third rectangle would be 180 times 0.5 because the third rectangle would be f of 10. That's about 180 times 0 0.5, the width of the rectangle plus 195 times 0.5 for the last rectangle's area, because f of 10.5 looks like, from the graph, it's about 195. And if you add up all these areas, you'll get about 312.5. And since we're talking about phone calls, you would ignore the 0.5 phone call, so about 312 calls occurred between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. So let's look at a similar example. Example 5, average of rectangle approximations. The table shows rates of population growth for Berrytown for several years. Use this table to approximate the total population growth from 1985 and 2015. So the year in the table is 1985, 1995, 2005, and 2015. The Y values would be the rate of population growth, capital R of T, which is given as thousands of people per year, 1.5, 1.9, 2.2, .2, and 2.4 respectively. The definite integral of the rate of change gives the total population in Barrytown over these 30 years. And we know that we can approximate the area under the curve using approximation rectangles. So we're going to use approximation rectangles to estimate the total population for Barrytown between 1985 and 2015. So the first thing to figure out is what's going to be the width of each rectangle or each subinterval. Well, notice in the table values that the value of the years count up by 10. So it makes sense for the width of each rectangle to be 10. So the width of each rectangle or the width of each subinterval will be 2015 minus 1985. So the population stops at 2015 and it starts at 1985, so the width of that interval would be 30 years. And we want to divide this up into three rectangles because we want to use either the left endpoint or the right endpoint. So we can only use three of those four values that are given in the table of values. So 30 divided by 3, which will be 10 years. So each subinterval will be 10 years in width. So let's use left endpoints. The left endpoints would be capital L for left endpoint, three rectangles, so the subscript is 3. We would use the function capital R prime because we're talking about the rate of growth of the population, R of T, so R prime of 1985. That would be the left-hand endpoint for the first rectangle because the first rectangle would go between 1985 and 1995 times 10 for the width of that interval plus the area of the next rectangle would be R prime of 1995. That's the left endpoint for the second interval and times the width of that interval would be 10 plus R prime of 2005. 2005 would be the left endpoint for the third rectangle, and then the width of the third rectangle would also be 10. So now let's choose a table of values. R prime of 1985 would be 1.5, so 1.5 times 10. R prime of 1995, that would be 1.9, so 1.9 times 10, plus the area of the last rectangle would be R prime of 2005, that's 2.2, and the width of the interval was 10, so 2.2 times 10. And if you calculate this value, you'll get 56. So now let's say we use right endpoints instead of using left endpoints. The right endpoints would be capital R sub 3, using three subintervals again. We would have R prime of 1995 because the first interval would go between 1985 and 1995, but if we're using right endpoints, then we're using the value at 1995 to determine the height of the rectangle. So R prime of 1995 times the width of the rectangle, which would be 10, plus R prime of 2005 for the second rectangle, using the right endpoint, times 10, plus R prime of 2015 for the right endpoint for the last rectangle, times the width of the rectangle would be 10. So now, again, use the table values to find out the values of R prime of 1995, R prime of 2005, and R prime of 2015. So R prime of 1995 would be 1.9, so 1.9 times 10, plus R prime of 2005 times 10, so 2.2 times 10, plus R prime of 2015 
times 10. So 2.4 times 10. And if you calculate these values and add them up for the areas of the rectangles, you get 65. So one method that we can use is that we know that the left endpoints and the right endpoints are approximations themselves. What if we average the rectangle approximations? Let's take the average of the two approximations for the left endpoints and the right endpoints to get in a better estimate. So the average between 56 and 65 would be 56 plus 65, and we had two different approximations, so divide by 2. And so 56 plus 65 in the numerator divided by 2 will be 60.5. So 60.5 thousand people. That's an approximation for how much the population changed for Berrytown between 1985 and 2015. So you may have noticed up until this point, we've insisted that the integrand be positive. That's because we've been discussing area, and it's always, when we talk about area, positive values. However, the height of each approximation rectangle can be a negative value sometimes. So what that means is that when you take that value, the height of the rectangle, and it's a negative value, and you multiply by the width, which is always a positive number, then that gives you a negative value for that area of the approximation rectangle. However, you should think of this as it's the area of the rectangle, but with a negative sign. It turns out that it's very useful to think of the possibility of having a negative area. We're going to now extend the definition for the definite integral to now include integrands that might not necessarily be positive. They can also be positive or negative values. So the definite integral and signed area. The definite integral of the function f of x from x equals a to x equals b is the signed area under the curve y equals f of x. If the function is positive, then the signed area is a positive number because the area is completely above the x-axis. However, if the function is negative, that means the function is below the x-axis, and so the areas of the regions below the x-axis will have a negative value because the height of the rectangle will be a negative value because the y values are negative. And so the definite integral from x equals a to x equals b of f of x dx can be interpreted this way. You find out the area that is above the x-axis, you find out the area that's below the x-axis, and you subtract the two. It's always the area above the x-axis, subtract the area below the x-axis, and that's the definition for the definite integral from x equals a to x equals b, where f of x can have positive or negative values. So now we're going to talk about how to actually find the area without actually using approximation of rectangles. If the function f of x is continuous on a closed interval, x equals a to x equals b, but it forms some simple geometric figure, such as a rectangle, a triangle, or a trapezoid, then we can determine the area using the geometric formula. So example six, evaluate the definite integral. We're going to find out what is the actual area under the curve this time, not approximating using the rectangles. So sketch the region corresponding to each of the following definite integrals and evaluate each integral using a simple geometric formula. So number one, find out the area under the curve starting at x equals one and ending at x equals four for this function. The function is y equals negative two and the variable integration is x. So let's start off by sketching out what is this region that we're trying to find. We want to graph the function f of x equals negative 2 or y equals negative 2 because that's the integrand. And if you know what the graph of the function will look like, it's a horizontal line because it's y equals negative 2 always. The x values don't matter. The y values must be negative 2. So this graph will be a horizontal line that crosses the y-axis at 0 comma negative 2. So you have the x-axis and y-axis, but then the line y equals negative 2 is graphed here. We want to find out what is the area that is bounded by the x-axis that starts at x equals 1 and ends at x equals 4. So the area would be below the x-axis, so we should expect the definite integral to be a negative value here because we have more area below the x-axis than we do above the x-axis. In fact, the area is entirely below the x-axis in this case. The area starts at x equals 1 and the area stops at x equals 4 from the definite integral, from the lower and upper limits of integration. So this region forms a rectangle. The length of the rectangle is determined from x equals 1 to x equals 4, so it looks like the length of the rectangle will be 3. Keep in mind that the y value for the function determines the height of the rectangle. So the height of the rectangle is actually y equals negative 2. So you'll have negative 2 times 3 for the area of this rectangle, or negative 6. That is the signed area of this region because it's below the x-axis. Now let's try another one, number 2. Let's find out the value of the definite integral from x equals 1 to x equals 3, where the function is 1 plus x, and the variable integration is x. So you would read this as the indefinite integral 1 to 3 of 1 plus x dx. So this time the function is f of x equals 1 plus x, or y equals x plus 1. This is a linear function. The slope is 1, and the y-intercept is 1. So it's going to cross the y-axis at 0 comma 1, and the slope is 1, the rise divided by run. So let's look at what region we're actually trying to find the area of. 
So we have the graph y equals x plus 1 here. We have the y-axis and x-axis. The graph will cross the y-axis at 0, 1. That's the y-intercept. And then you have a rise divided by run of 1. So the graph would rise 1 and run 1, rise 1, run 1, and so on. We want to find out the area under the curve and bounded by the x-axis between x equals 1 and x equals 3. So the area starts at x equals 1 and it ends at x equals 3. So to find out where are these points on the graph, well, plug in 1 into your function. You'll have 1 plus 1, the y value is 2. So this point on the graph is 1, 2. Same thing for 3, 4. If you plug in 3 into your function, you'll get the y value is 4. So I know that this point's at 1, 2, this point's at 3, 4, and the y-intercept is 0, 1 because we know that the graph will cross the y-axis at 1. So since this region is entirely above the x-axis, we should expect a positive answer only here. So this region forms a figure that we can actually find the area of. It's a trapezoid. Or if you want to break this up into two smaller figures, you have a rectangle and you also have a little triangle. So let's find out the area of the triangle and the area of the rectangle separately. So the rectangle would have a length of starts at x equals 1 and ends at x equals 3. So that, so that width is 2. And now the height of the rectangle. Well, the height of the rectangle, because we're dividing this up into a rectangle and a triangle, the height of the rectangle would be when y equals 2. So it's a length of 2 and a height of 2. So the area of the rectangle is 4. So now let's figure out the area of the triangle. The area for the triangle is 1 half times base times height. So the 1 half is part of the formula. The base of this rectangle, we know that that width is 2 already from the rectangle's form calculation. And now the height of the triangle. We know that the height of the triangle will also be 2 because this one stops at 4 and this y value was 2. So the height of the rectangle would be 2, the base is 2, and the 1 half is part of the formula. So 1 half times base times height would be 1 half times 2 times 2. So the area under the curve, 1 plus x, between x equals 1 and x equals 3 would be 2 times 2, that's the area of the rectangle, plus 1 half times 2 times 2 for the area of the triangle, which will be 4 plus 2, or 6. So the area that's bounded by the curve and the x-axis between x equals 1 and x equals 3 is 6. Negative values indicate that the amount is decreasing. For example, if the function f of t represents the velocity of a car in the positive direction along a straight line at time t, and it's given in miles per hour, the negative values of f of t would indicate the car is traveling in the negative direction or backwards. The definite integral of f of t is the change in the position of the car during that time. On the other hand, you can think of it as if the velocity is positive, the positive distance will accumulate, and if the velocity is negative, in other words, if the car is going backwards, the distance in the negative direction will accumulate. This observation is true for any rate of change in, in terms of any derivative. For example, if f of t represents the rate of population change in people per year for a town, the negative value for f of t would indicate that the population of the town was getting smaller, and the definite integral would be a change in the population, which would be a decrease during that time interval. So example seven, rate of population change. Suppose in 1980, there were 12,000 ducks nestling around a lake, and the rate of population change in ducks per year is shown in the following figure. So we have this graph. The graph is y equals negative 200. Now this is representing a rate of change. This is f prime of x equals negative 200, or y prime equals negative 200. And we have this region that is shaded, that is bounded by the graph, and between 1980 and 1990. Write a definite integral to represent the total change in the duck population from 1980 to 1990, and estimate the population in 1990. So since the function f of x represents the population function for x is the year, f prime of x is the rate of the population change in ducks per year. So f prime of x is negative 200 because we want to talk about the function y equals negative 200 from the graph. And we also have the function defined only between 1980 and 1990 for this figure. The definite integral would be the total change in the duck population between 1980 and 1990. It's the integral from 1980 to 1990. So the area starts at 1980 and the area stops at 1990. The integrand is the rate of change in the population change in the ducks. So it would be f prime of x dx, which will be the integral from 1980 to 1990. The function is negative 200 dx, so the variable integration is x. And so now let's find out an approximation using the area of this figure. So we have a rectangle. The width of the rectangle is between 1980 and 1990, so that's a 10-year difference. So the width of the rectangle is 10. And notice that the height of the rectangle is determined by the height of the function which is the value of negative 200. So the height of the rectangle is negative 200. 
So you have negative 200 times the difference in the years, 1990 minus 1980, or 10 years. So you have negative 200 times 10, or negative 2,000 ducks. So between 1980 and 1990, there was a change in the duck population by negative 2,000. So that answers the first part of the problem. What was the total change in the duck population? The duck population decreased by 2,000 ducks. Now estimate the population in 1990. The population in 1990 is f of 1990. Let's use the population in 1980 that was given in the problem. The problem said the 1980 population for ducks was 12,000 nestling around the lake. So you would have f of 1980, that was the starting population, and we know the population changed by decreasing the duck population by 2,000 over that 10-year period. So take the population that we started off with, decrease it by 2,000, so subtract 2,000, so 12,000 minus 2,000, now there's only 10,000 ducks left in 1990, nestling around the lake. So let's talk about one more example. Example 8, velocity of a bug. A bug starts at the location x equals 12 on the x-axis at 1 p.m. and walks along the axis with a velocity v of x as shown in the graph. How far does the bug travel between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m.? And where is the bug located at 3 p.m.? So this example is very similar to the last one that we did except this one's talking about the bug's location on the x-axis, whereas the last problem was talking about population of ducks. So notice in the graph, you have 1 p.m., 2 p.m., and 3 p.m. labeled, and we want to find out the area bounded by the graph between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. for the bug. And the y values are representing velocity in feet per hour for the bug. Notice that the velocity is positive between 1 p.m. and 2.30 p.m. So if we want to calculate this area, it would be a positive value whereas the values between 2.30 and 3 p.m., the velocity is a negative value. And if we calculate the area bounded by the curve, it will be a signed value. So if the velocity is positive, that means the bug was moving in the positive direction. On the other hand, if the velocity is negative, that means the bug is moving in the negative direction, or backwards. So if we want to find out the total distance from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. for the bug, it would be the definite integral from 1 to 3, v of x dx, so the velocity function, or the derivative of position, we can find out the area of these two areas separately. We can find out the area from 1 to 2.5 or 2.30 p.m. because we know that this value will be a positive number. It's the area above the x-axis plus the area below the x-axis would be the values from integral 2.5 to 3, so 2.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. of the velocity function. So let's calculate the area that's above the x-axis. So we have 1 to 2.30 p.m. We have this area of the rectangle and we have this little triangle. So the area of the rectangle would be length times width. The width is 1, and the height of the rectangle, or the length, is 10. So 1 times 10 is 10. So the area of this rectangle is 10. Now the area of the triangle. You have a width of 0 0.5 because it's between 2 and 2.30 p.m. So using the area of the triangle, you would have area is 1 half times base times height. You would have area is 1 half times the base is a half, or 0 0.5, and the height of the triangle is 10. So 1 half times 10 times 0.5 is 2.5. So the area of this triangle is 2.5. So this first value of the integral from 1 to 2.5 is 10 plus 2.5, the sum of those two areas. Now for the area between 2.30 and 3. You have the area that's below the x-axis, so we'll get a negative value for the definite integral. We have another triangle where the base is a half between 2.30 and 3 p.m. That's 30 minutes, or 0 0.5 hours. And the height of the rectangle, it looks like the height of the rectangle would be negative 10. So you have the area of the triangle would be 1 half times negative 10 times 0 0.5 or negative 2.5. So the value of the definite integral from 2.5 to 3 of v of x dx would be negative 2.5. So to add up all the areas together, you would have 10 plus 2.5 minus 2.5 or just 10. That means that the bug has traveled 10 feet between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Now to answer the question about where is the bug located at 3 p.m., let's use its starting position. It was a starting position at 12. So at 3 p.m., the bug is at a positive value of x equals 22 because the bug started at 12 and it traveled 10 feet in the positive direction. So 12 plus 10 will give you 22. So now it's on the x-axis at a position of 22. Properties of the definite integral. Since the definite integral was defined as the limit of a Riemann sum, the properties of sums are also properties for the definite integral. So in particular, the properties that we have learned previously about the indefinite integral are also true for the definite integral. So properties of the definite integral, if f of x and g of x are continuous functions and k is a constant, a real number, then number one, the first property about definite integrals is called the zero width interval. If so if you want to find out the area under the curve where the definite integral is x equals a to x equals a, f of x dx, then you're talking about finding the area under the curve on the closed interval from a to a. 
Well, that interval has no width. So the width of the rectangles that are approximating the area would all be zero. So the area under the curve would be zero. So it doesn't matter what the function itself is. If you have the lower and upper limit of integration the same, then the area under the curve will be zero. Property number two, reversing the order of integration. So if you want to find out the area from x equals a to x equals b of the function f of x dx, then you can also reverse the order of integration. Let's say you start at x equals b and go up to x equals a. Then you reverse the order. You've swapped the lower limit and the upper limit of integration to be the opposite. But the function stays the same. However, you have the opposite area. That's what the property is saying. If you reverse the order of integration, then you must introduce a negative sign where the limits of integration have been swapped. Property number three, we've seen this one before, the constant multiple rule. So if you have some function times a constant and you want to find out the area under the curve from x equals a to x equals b, then you can find out the area under the curve of the function f of x itself from x equals a to x equals b, find out that area, and then multiply your answer by k. So this property should be very familiar to you because we found out this with indefinite integrals also. If you find out the family of antiderivatives for the function, then you multiply the entire family of antiderivatives by k. Number four, the sum rule. If you have the integral from x equals a to x equals b of two functions added together, then you can find out the area of each function separately from x equals a to x equals b. So you have the area from x equals a to x equals b of the first function f of x, keep the sign between the two different integrals, and then find out the area from x equals a to x equals b of g of x separately, and find out these two areas added together. Number five, the difference rule is exactly the same thing as number four, except the plus is now changed to a minus sign. So you have the definite integral from x equals a to x equals b, f of x minus g of x dx, find out the area from x equals a to x equals b of f of x, then subtract, so keep the sign between the terms, between the integrals, find out the area from x equals a to x equals b of g of x, and then subtract your two different answers in the same order that it appears in the integrand of the first integral. And then number six is called the additivity rule. If you find out the area from x equals a to x equals b of f of x, and you find out the area from x equals b to x equals c of f of x, so the same function, first function is find out the area from a to b, the second integral is find out the area from b to c, then you really found out the area from a to c already for the entire function. So that would be the area from x equals a to x equals c of f of x dx. Example nine, properties of definite integrals. Given the values of the definite integrals, integral from negative one to one, f of x dx is five, the integral from one to four, f of x dx is negative two, and the integral from negative one to one of g of x dx is seven, evaluate the following definite integrals using the properties of definite integrals. So these three values for the integrals are given, find out the values of the following integrals. Number one, integral from four to four of f of x dx. So the lower limit of integration is four and the upper limit of integration is four. There is no width for this closed interval. So this would be the zero width interval says this value for the integral is zero. Number two, the integral from one to negative one f of x dx. So it looks like the order of integration has been reversed compared to this first integral. This first integral was from negative one to one of f of x dx, it was five. This integral that we're trying to find is from x equals one to x equals negative one of f of x dx. We can use the reverse the order of integration formula. That means you can reverse the order of integration, but you have to insert a negative sign. It's the opposite value of the integral. So it's the opposite value of integral from negative one to one of f of x dx. So that would be the opposite of positive five. So you get an, a value of negative five for this definite integral. Number three, let's find out the value of this definite integral from negative one to four of f of x dx. So which of the values that we were given can we use? Well, we know the area from negative one to one of f of x. We also know the area under the curve of f of x from x equals one to x equals four. This one is going from x equals negative one to x equals positive four. So this is really the additivity rule that we need to use. It's the area from negative one to one of f of x dx plus the integral from x equals one to four of f of x dx. So we can take these two values and add them together because we are going from negative one to one and then one to four, and that's really like going from negative one to four anyways. So five plus negative two will give you positive three for the value of this definite integral. Number four, the integral from negative one to one of negative four times the function f of x dx. So we know that we can use the constant multiple rule to take the constant negative four and bring it outside the integral sign. So we can find out the integral from negative one to one of f of x itself and then multiply that answer by negative four. So negative four times the integral from negative one to one of f of x dx. Well, we know the value of integral from negative one to one of f of x dx, it was five. So we take negative four times five and that value of this integral from negative one to one of negative four times f of x dx is negative 20.
And then number five, the integral from negative one to one of three times f of x, subtract five times g of x dx. So we have to use several properties for this integral. Notice that this is a difference between two different functions. You have three times f of x is one function, subtract five times g of x, that's the second function. So we can break this up into two different integrals with a minus sign between them using the difference rule. So you have the integral from negative one to one of three times f of x dx plus the integral from negative one to one of negative five times g of x dx. Now we can use the constant multiple rule to take the constants outside the integral sign of each integral. So three can be taken outside this first integral and negative five can be taken outside the second integral as a constant. So you have three times the integral from negative one to one of f of x dx minus five integral negative one to one of g of x dx. We did this because we know the value of the integral from negative one to one of f of x, it was five. We also know the value of the integral from negative one to one of g of x, it is seven. So we have three times five, subtract five times seven, so 15 subtract 35 or negative 20. So the value of this integral from negative one to one of three times f of x minus five times g of x is negative 20. So let's try one more example. Example 10, area under a curve. Use the graph below to calculate each of the following definite integrals. So we have the area that's under the curve, starting at x equals zero to x equals five. So notice you have some regions above the x-axis, so those values will be positive, and you have a region that's below the x-axis, that area will be a signed area. So this area is represented as a five. We know that the definite integral would be negative five for that value. So number one, find out the value of the definite integral from x equals zero to x equals two of the function f of x dx. So let's look at the graph. Between x equals zero and x equals two, the graph is above the x-axis, and it looks like the area that's under the curve bounded by the x-axis between x equals zero and x equals two, that area is two from the figure. Number two, find out the area under the curve from x equals two to x equals four of f of x dx. So notice from the figure, you have from x equals two to x equals four, the function is below the x-axis. So that value of the definite integral will be a negative value. So the area is five, that means the definite integral will have a negative five. The signed area is negative because the region is below the x-axis. So a couple more, number three, Find out the value of the definite integral from x equals four to x equals five of f of x dx. So notice from the figure that the graph is entirely above the x-axis between x equals four and x equals five, so the value is positive two. So number four, find out the value of the definite integral from zero to five f of x dx. We can use the additivity rule to find out the value of this integral because the integral from zero to two f of x dx plus the integral from two to four f of x dx plus the integral from four to five f of x dx is just the sum of the areas from zero to two, two to four, and four to five collectively. So the value of the first integral from zero to two was two, integral from two to four of f of x dx was negative five value, and the integral from four to five f of x dx we just found out was two. So you have two plus negative five plus two, that gives you negative one. So that means that the signed area from x equals zero to x equals five of the function bounded by the x-axis is negative one. In the previous examples, we looked at a function represented as a rate of travel, which means that the area is represented by a total distance traveled. For functions representing other rates of change, such as population of a factory, or the flow of water in a river, or traffic over a bridge, or the spread of a disease, the area still represents the total amount of quantity. So this finishes our video on the properties of definite integrals. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus.